All right. When you see integrals like this, let me just get my little blackboard substitute going. Integrals like this. So I have the, and I'm going to go ahead and write it as a triple integral. Since there were three differentials, um, it was a triple integral of, and this was the one that was in the reading questions, r vector times rho times dx dy dz. It is worth looking at these and being able to interpret them. And from the reading questions, there was sort of a mix here at what, how well you interpreted it. Well, so first of all, when you see something like that, let's go ahead and draw this. Um, so I have an x axis. Uh, how do I want to do this? I'll do a y axis up, a z axis pointing out. And then you have some object. It's some blob. Imagine that's a 3D blob, right? So I'll draw. I don't know if that helped it look 3D or whatever or not. All right, our vector, some position in space. So here's a position in space, and I'm going to draw a dx, dy, and dz, right? That's a little q. So dx, dy, dz is like a differential volume. And then our vector is the position of that differential volume. Well, another way of writing rho d volume, where rho is density. Now, Taylor uses rho for the radial cylindrical radial coordinate. I wish he didn't do that because I like to use rho for density. So here, and everything I'm going to do today, rho is going to be a density. Rho d vol, you could also write that as dm, where that's a little differential mass. So if now if I have a sum of r dm, where that's a differential mass, well, here's the other thing to remember, is that um, an integral is a sum. I know you probably got used to thinking of it as an area under a curve. Well, if you just have f of x and x, and you have some function, right? And then, and this is where this precision of drawing here is a little tough. If I divide it into a whole bunch of little delta x width rectangles, and then f of x times delta x is the area of that one rectangle, um, and then I add up all those rectangles, I get the area under the curve. My point with this is that the area under the curve is actually a um, special interpretation of the more general interpretation of an integral as a sum. An integral is a sum. And then the area under the curve is the sum of all the little differential areas of those little rectangles under the curve, right? Riemann sum. You may have heard these areas referred to as a Riemann sum. An integral is a sum. So I could have written this and I'm going to do the approximate, I'll tell you why in a moment, as the sum of r alpha m alpha, where now what I've done instead of having my blob here, let's see if I can draw my blob again, it's supposed to look the same. Instead of that, I've made it as a collection of points, and it really should be in 3D, but I'm not going to try and draw that. Right? It's a collection of a whole bunch of little points where each point has some... All right, so there's r alpha to that point, and each point has some mass m alpha. That's basically uh, the discrete approximation to the continuum um, of this blob on the top here. So the integral of r dm, so I tried to hopefully convince you that this integral is the same as the integral of r dm, which is the limit of this discrete sum when you go to a continuous thing, go from discrete discrete to continuous, and that's the limit that you do when you're doing calculus. This is just the center of mass. That's all this is. This expression you recognize from Taylor as the center of mass. That's what this integral is, right? So answers I got included the mass. How could you know that was wrong? Well, look at it. Um, there's two ways you can know it wrong. First of all, this integral is going to give you a vector because there's no dot products in here. So it's going to be a vector quantity. Mass is not a vector. Second, look at the units of it. Um, I have r is units of, of distance, then I have rho is units of mass per volume, and then I have dx dy dz is distance cubed is the same as volume. That's going to cancel the um, uh, that's going to cancel the uh, this is not the center of mass. <laughs> this is the center of mass times the mass. Look at that. Um, so if I had had out front one over m, 
where m is the mass of the whole object, then it's the center of mass. And notice I figured that out by thinking about the units. Lesson here. Units are useful to think about. So that mass will cancel the mass in the row. The dx, dy, dz will cancel the volume in the row. You'll be left with just a vector distance. That is the center of mass, right? Um, and so this is actually not the center of mass. You would multiply that by 1 over m, the mass of where, where m, in this case, go away, please go away, is equal to the sum of m alpha, right? That's the, the mass of the whole thing. That is the center of mass, all right? So um, it's worth being able to look at these integrals and recognize them as that sort of thing. Um, one of the other answers I got, I've, so far there's only about five answers in the reading questions. Um, so I'm hoping the rest of you will do them in the next, there's an hour left as of when this is recording. One of the other things I got was, looks like a moment of inertia of some sort. Well, okay, it's not a moment of inertia of some sort. Um, it's just a um, center of mass. But that answer is actually, strictly speaking, not wrong because the moment of inertia integrals kind of look like this. Here's the difference. The moment of inertia and the products of inertia were all scalars here. Now, we will see in the reading for Monday that moment of inertia is actually a tensor. Scary, scary, boogie, boogie. But for now, we're just talking about really components of that tensor. Um, the products of inertia, and then the moment of inertia is a special case of the products of inertia. So let's look at those products of inertia. So for example, um, actually, let's just start with, well, we'll start with, all right, I'm going to draw my blob again here. So I have some blob. Here's the center of mass of that blob. And let's say that the blob is rotating. That's supposed to look like an axis through the thing. The blob is rotating at rate omega around the center of mass. And in fact, let's go ahead and assert, um, so this omega vector is equal to zero, oh, comma, zero, comma, omega, right? Omega is the magnitude of the vector. All right, so it's rotating around like that. Well, so the um, angular momentum about the z-axis of this object, so that's the z component of angular momentum, which is also the angular momentum or the magnitude of the angular momentum in this case, it turns out, if that's the center of mass there, is going to be the sum over alpha of um, m alpha times x alpha squared plus y alpha squared times omega. Now, it's worth looking at what is x alpha squared plus y alpha squared. That is just, right, so pick some point in here that's at some x, y, z that distance off of the axis, and in fact, let me draw this slightly differently so it's a little clearer what I'm trying to draw here. Um, so here's the center of mass. Here is some point, I'm gonna draw it over here, and then that is the distance off of the axis. We'll call that capital R alpha. The distance from the axis, that is also, capital R alpha is also the radial coordinate and cylindrical coordinates, right, the r phi z, well, r alpha is just, of course, the square root of x squared plus y squared because the axis is the z axis, right? That's what r alpha is. So this is just r alpha squared. So we have the sum of m r squared omega, and then you recognize m r squared omega as, as how, in fact, you recognize m r squared as the moment of inertia of a point, or m r squared omega as the, um, uh, of, a, of a point mass rotating around a point of, of its angular momentum. So let's let's consider a simple example. Let's consider x and y, and suppose I have some point that is, and we're going to put it on the y-axis for simplicity here, and we're going to say it's moving at speed v in the x-axis. I want to get what is the moment of inertia, not the moment of inertia, what's the angular momentum of this object as measured around the origin? Um, well, you remember, in general, the angular momentum of a point is just r cross p, where r is the displacement of that point from your origin about which you're measuring angular momentum, and p is the momentum of that. So in this case, that r, if you look at it, let's call that distance y. Why not? It's a y-axis. So it's going to be y, y hat. Um, and then you cross it with p, which in this case is m v x hat. Right? So we're going to get um, mv 
why um, brain just died on me y hat cross x hat now here's the other thing let's suppose that this is just momentary the particles actually moving around in a circle like this and you know that and then the radius of the circle is what I've called y here you know that the magnitude of v is equal to omega times y where omega is the angular speed around the circle so I'm going to substitute that in here so we're going to have m and then the magnitude of v and this oh by the way I goofed up this vector shouldn't have been here because I have v x hat is v vector so there's no vector there so the magnitude of v is omega y so I have m y squared omega in the minus z hat direction right and so here I get m r squared right that's that moment inertia times omega that's exactly what I had up here and then you could also if you really wanted to be anal so first of all is the z axis in or out of the page well remember you need a right-handed coordinate system um, so I'm going to have to do uh, this is this is tough x cross y so you see z is out of the page and then if I try and look at my thing here um, I've got r cross p r is up and p in this case is to the right r cross p that's into the page hey look that's the minus z hat direction so the right hand rule gave you the right thing all right so that is the um, you know, all right, so that's the angular momentum of this guy around the object. But now the way we're talking about it now, and what I want to do is clean some of this stuff up here. I could have written this as LZ is equal to the sum over alpha of M alpha times X alpha squared plus Y alpha squared. Close that parenthesis times omega. And now this thing in the outer parentheses here is what we call IZZ. That's what you used to just call the moment of inertia. Now we are calling it the IZZ product of inertia. Well, so now let's go to a continuous object. So right now we just did one point. Well, so then if you had a whole bunch of points, you would add up this IZZ omega for all of the points, right? So, right, so LZ of an extended object would be the sum of IZZ alpha omega alpha. That's kind of perverse. That's yeah, you know what? Let's not go with that. Leave that out for now. Pretend I didn't say that. All right. So we want to go to a continuous object. We want to take this sum i z z of a continuous object. So what we have in place of m alpha, what we have is um, so this now becomes instead of the mass of the point, it becomes the mass of one of the little points. That's just going to be rho d volume. Right, which you could also write if you wanted is rho dx dy dz, but it's convenient often to write d volume in, in things like cylindrical coordinates. So izz, if you just write the whole thing out, izz for a continuous object. Um, right, so we're taking this sum of m alpha times x alpha squared plus y alpha squared, turning it into a continuous object is going to be um, x squared plus y squared times rho the density as a function of x y and z so that's what I mean with this functional notation here dx dy dz that this thing here that is just the um, continuum version of that thing IZZ, when you have a collection of points versus going to a continuum. So that's why when I asked you this question about the center of mass at the beginning, where I had that, that integral, uh, which I forgot to divide by m, so it was actually the mass times the center of mass is the integral I gave you in the reading questions. I want you to be able to recognize um, how you go from these sums of discrete particles to integrals over continuous distributions. So that's what we did here. Well, all right, so let's go ahead and do an example scribble all that out um, let's suppose am I actually recording yes let's suppose now that we have a cylinder and we're gonna let this cylinder rotate around its own axis right so we're gonna have some Omega like that um, let's go ahead and say that Omega vector is equal to Omega in the Z direction so we're defining the axis of the cylinder as the Z direction um, just to make life simple on us um, and then, so here's the center of mass of the cylinder. It's inside it. Here's a little piece of the cylinder. That's going to be like our M alpha. Um, and then the piece of the cylinder is some distance capital R off of the axis of the cylinder. 
then phi, I probably drew it in the wrong direction, but you get the idea. Phi is the angle of that, and then this distance here would be z. So we're using cylindrical coordinates, um, capital R. I'm using capital R as the cylindrical radius, r phi z. Um, right? Okay. And now we're going to say that the density of this cylinder is constant. And that'll make our life a little bit easier. Um, and in fact, we can, we can actually write down what the density of this is. It's going to be the mass of the cylinder divided by pi r naught squared z naught, where z naught is the height of the thing, and then r naught is the radius of the whole thing, right? So the density is just the mass divided by the volume. Uh, the volume of a cylinder is its base area times its height. So now, given this, I could write down, do I have enough room to do it over there? I'm going to do it down here so I have enough room. I'm going to do it in purple. I haven't used purple yet. I Z Z is equal to, and now I'm going to be a little explicit here. I'm going to integrate from R equals zero to R naught. I'm going to integrate phi from zero to two pi. And I'm going to integrate Z from minus Z naught over two to Z naught over two, because I have put the origin at the center of mass of this object. By the way, this way of doing integrals, I know often when you do triple integrals, you just write the limits. Um, and then there's something about the ordering of the integrals and the ordering of the differentials that you can figure out which limits go with which thing. I will often just uh, do this thing where I say R equals, so it's very clear which variable I'm talking about. Okay, so then I need to do X squared plus Y squared for the little point. Well, X squared plus Y squared, that's what r squared, the distance from the axis is, right? So that's the cylindrical r coordinate times the density, which I will write in as m over pi r naught squared z naught. Um, and now I just have to uh, integrate over the volume in cylindrical coordinates, r dr d phi dz, that is the volume element in cylindrical coordinates. How do I know that? Let's just look down. Um, it's terrible. It's no good. We don't like it. I just looked down on it. Okay, let's look down on the top of this cylinder. And I want to consider, I'm just going to consider the area element of a little differential thing here, who's got an angle d phi. Well, really, here, let's draw it like this. Here's the center. Boop, boop. So that angle is d phi. Um, let me erase that. I didn't like that. What I wanted, really, I'll draw that back in a moment but I'm going to label it right. This is dr, right? And then there's a dz in and out of the page. Well, this arc length here is just r d phi. So the area of this thing we're looking at is r d phi dr, right? And then you multiply it by a dz and you have the little volume. So that's how you can, that's how you can sort of remember that the volume element, um, and this should have been a d vol here, the volume element in cylindrical coordinates is r dr d phi dz. So that's what i z z would be. Well, all right. So this integral is not very hard to do because it turns out that you can completely separate it. So I'll move up here so I have a place to write. i z z, let's pull the constants out front. So the constants are just, well, the density. So m over pi r naught squared z naught. And now I can just easily separate this. I'm gonna have an integral from r equals zero to r zero. I wish it didn't do that. That's an R up there. Whatever. You know it's an R. I told you it was an R. If you look in here, I actually have um, I have R squared here and R here. So it's going to become R cubed dr, an integral from 0 to 2 pi. Oh, don't do that to me. Go away. Two. Yeah, there's a... All right. I, note to self, do not write near the top of the screen. And I think there's a way right here. I can do it like this. The integral 0 to 2 pi of d phi times the integral. And if you look, there's it's just the integral from minus z0 over 2 to z0 over 2 dz. Those are three easy integrals to do. So now let's see if I can move this guy back to where I want it. Like that. Um, that is going to be m over pi r naught squared z naught times the r integral is 1 fourth, r naught to the fourth. I did the integral and plugged in the limits all at once because I'm just, I live on the edge like that, times 2 pi from the phi integral. And the integral of dz from minus z0 over 2 to z0 over 2 is just z0. So the z0 cancels, the pi cancels, 
I have two fourths m. Um, oh, and r naught squared is going to cancel with r naught to the fourth to r naught squared. I get two fourths, which is the same as one half m r naught squared. And you may recognize, hey, wait a minute, I've heard that before. Where have I heard that before? It's when you looked up the tape on a table. What is the moment of inertia of a cylinder of radius r naught and mass m rotating about its axis, right? Um, that's where that moment of inertia comes from. You can just get it by doing the, doing the sum, and then the sum becomes an integral, right? Well, okay. Um, so that was the case of a cylinder that's rotating around its own axis. Let's make it more exciting because excitement is my middle name. Um, A-N-D-R-E-W, pronounced excitement. And um, let's rotate the cylinder around its edge like this. So if we rotate the cylinder around its edge like this, now things are a little bit different. So um, just to try and draw the picture here, here is the z-axis. And then the cylinder is rotating around the z-axis like that. Well, actually, hmm, I don't know if I want to call that the z-axis. We'll decide what I'm going to call this in a moment. I think, actually, I still, for the sake of, well, that's all right. That's the axis of rotation. For the sake of doing this integral, I'm still going to set the origin of my coordinate system at the center of mass. And now what we just have to, to, to realize is that um, in place of that x squared plus y squared, I need the distance from this axis of rotation. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Right, so the directions of the axes, I'm going to still put the origin at the center of mass. The directions of the axes are x, y, and c. And then if you look down on this from the top, right, here is the point we're rotating around. Here is the center of mass. Let's suppose that's our little mass object. What we need is this distance, right? Um, so this, right, that's the point it's rotating around. So this is... Since we're looking down on this, let's say that that's x and that's y, right? I've just taken the cylinder and rotated it. Um, this is the, the y that we care about. Um, let's call this y care because it's the y that we care about. And that is, this is the x that we care about. Um, well, okay, and of course, this thing here, that's actual y and that's actual x. So just looking at this, you can see that um, y care is equal to y. Um, and then here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to define that angle as phi because that's what phi is. Oh, except it should have come off of the x-axis. You know what? I lied to you when I told you this was x and y. Really? I should have gone with something more traditional because that's what I'm doing here. Really? That's x and y. So that's just how I've rotated the cylinder to look down on it. So now that really is phi, the way I've drawn it. So x care, that distance is going to equal r0, right? Because that's, this distance is r0. And then this distance is just x um, minus r cosine phi. Why did I decide that r cosine phi? So this distance here is r. If I had been smart and I had drawn my thing here, Right? instead of over in the lower left quadrant, then this would have been phi, and it would have been transparent that this is r cosine phi, and then the distance from this axis would have been r0 minus r cosine phi, and that gives you that distance here. All right, so that's the x care about, and that's the y we care about, so then this distance um, that we want to use in the integral is just going to be x care squared plus y care squared. So now the integral I want to do this IZZ integral, actually I'll do here at the bottom. Let's go back to red now. IZZ is going to equal, um, I'm just going to write the density as rho for now, is equal to rho times the integral of r from 0 to r0 times the integral of phi from 0 to 2 pi times the integral of z from um, minus c0 over 2 to z0 over 2, where z0 is the height of the thing. I should have called it h, but I called it z0, so you're going to cope. I factored the row out front, so we're now going to just have to have this distance that we care about, which is going to be 
um, r squared sine squared phi plus um, r0 minus r cosine phi squared, isn't that scary? Uh, times d vol in cylindrical coordinate, that's r dr d phi dz. Okay, um, so let's start working this out. Um, so this integral is not as separable. Just look at it, though. You notice there's nothing depends on z, so I'm just going to do the z integral by inspection. So I get izz is equal to rho times z0, right? That's what the z integral is going to work out to be. And I still have to keep this as a double integral. So we have the integral over r and the integral over phi. And I'm going to square this thing out. So I'm going to have a r squared sine squared phi plus, and I'm going to do the square in a weird order here, r squared cosine squared phi plus r0 squared minus 2r r0 uh, cosine phi times r dr d phi. Oh, and not dz anymore because I already did the z integral. All right, that's what we've got. Um, notice I have a, and this is, remember, I want, I want your instincts. Whenever you see sine squared plus cosine squared, you think, oh, that's just one. So that's r squared sine squared theta plus r squared cosine squared theta is just one. So I'm, I'm going to break up these integrals. So I have rho z zero times the integral of r squared, and then I have to bring the r from the end, r dr d phi, plus um, the integral of r naught squared r dr d phi, plus the integral of minus 2 um, r, and I'll just bring in the r from the other thing, r squared r naught cosine phi dr d phi. Pretend there's a dr d phi out there. Um, and then I close the bracket. Okay. Um, look at the phi integral here. What is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of cosine phi d phi? It's 0. So this term here goes to 0, and that wasn't so bad. Um, I'm going to go ahead and write out rho as mass divided by pi r naught squared z naught, right? That is the volume of the thing, times z naught. Hey, look at that. Let's go ahead and cancel it now. Uh, all right, I had the integral of uh, d phi from 0 to 2 pi, and then I had the integral of r cubed dr from 0 to r naught, so that's going to be r naught to the fourth over r, that's just the same one I did before, plus now this second term here, I had the integral from 0 to 2 pi d phi, that's 2 pi, I had the integral from 0 to r naught of, um, or, of r naught squared times r, well so r naught squared is a constant, I can just pull that out, the integral of r from 0 to r naught is going to be r naught squared over 2, so that becomes r naught to the fourth over 2. Um, you were wondering, why did he say two, 4 and write r? And the answer is because brains are difficult things that don't work the way you want. All right? Well, okay, so now I've got a pi in every term. I can cancel out the pi's here. I have 2 fourths plus 1 half. That is equal to 3 fourths. I get, um, and then I have r naught squared with r naught to the fourth. Those will partially cancel. So I have two fourths plus one half. That's three fourths. I get three fourths m r naught squared. Okay. So what this tells us is that if you have two cases, first, this is the one we did before. If I have a cylinder that's rotating the speed omega around that way, and it's got radius r zero. Um, it's IZZ, assuming Z is out of the page here, is 1 half MR0 squared. We worked that out before. If instead the cylinder is rotating around its edge like this, then, and it's still got radius R0, IZZ is the thing that I have down below, is 3 fourths. I made an error. You may have noticed on the previous thing there is a... Um, that there is the 2 and the 2 pi, which I never canceled. So this 3 fourths, Robert learned to erase. This 3 fourths here should have been 3 halves. I hope you noticed that when I was doing my math and did my arithmetic wrong. It is true that um, 1 half plus, 
uh, one fourth is three fourths, but there was also the two on the two pi that should have turned the one, the four in the denominator to a two. So this becomes three halves m r zero squared. All right. Um, well, okay. So that's got a different i z z. Let us connect this though. Let us connect this to this other expression we had here. So let me do a little bit of erasing because we've got that above now. Um, the other expression from Taylor that the L, I'm just writing this bit. No, I'm not writing it big. I need to, L is equal to R cross, so RCM cross PCM. So that's the displacement of, from whatever point you care about, it's the displacement of the center of mass um, crossed with the momentum of the center of mass plus the angular momentum of the object about the center of mass, right? This is a useful thing. The proof of this, just remember from Taylor, the proof starts with L is equal to, the proof starts with the sum over of alpha of R alpha cross MV alpha, right? And then look at Taylor. Um, the proof actually has like, there's a bunch of terms. He breaks the thing down to a bunch of terms. He argues some of the terms are zero, and then it comes to this. This expression here is not obvious. At least it's not obvious in the sense that you can't just by inspection say, oh, of course, the angular momentum is going to be the angular momentum of the center of mass plus the angular momentum about the center of mass, right? That's not obvious unless you're used to it. So what does obvious really mean? What does obvious mean? What does intuitive mean? What's intuitive is really what you're used to. Well, so maybe you're used to this and so it's obvious. Right? Oh, it's obvious. It's just like the uh, obvious that the integral of e to the minus x squared over two sigma squared is root two pi sigma squared. You knew that, root two pi sigma. Well, all right, root two pi sigma, two pi sigma, Never mind. Um, is that obvious? No, it's not obvious, but I've done it enough that I remember the result. So um, that's the difference between intuitive and what you're used to. This is not something that you could just look down and do by inspection. And the reason I talk about that is you might you think about some of these things like when we were doing um, Lagrangians and I had an object with a point here and then this whole thing was rotating and what's the kinetic energy of that um, object and you wanted, you have to be really careful when you really write it out in terms of your coordinates, you end up with weird cross terms and stuff. So the obvious isn't always obvious. All right, get rid of that. So, but this here, um, this does work. Well, all right, so remember these two, two results. We're going to come back to them in some a moment. What I want to do now is go back to this cylinder that's rotating around this point. Well, instantaneously, that means it has a, the center of mass has a velocity of V, which is equal to omega R zero. And let's go ahead and define some axes. Let's define that as X, we'll define that as Y. Y, um, so omega R zero, it's in the X hat direction. RCM at the moment, and that's the velocity of the center of mass, right? Because that's this point right here. Um, it's moving around in a circle with omega like that. Um, RCM at this point is just equal to R naught Y hat, right? That's just what it is. That's RCM is that. Um, so if I do RCM cross MVCM, right? That's the R cross P. I'm going to get R naught Y hat cross M omega R naught X hat. Um, that's going to give me um, R not Y hat cross, this is a, let me put parentheses in here so the cross product looks more like a cross product instead of an X. Um, that's going to give me M R not squared omega minus Z hat, Y hat cross X hat is minus Z hat. Okay, so I have M R not squared omega minus Z hat. Now, and, and of course, here's the thing. What is the rate at which that it's rotating around the center of mass? Well, this, the cylinder, um, when it makes one complete rotation, its orientation has also gone all the way around once. So in this case, its rotation around the center of mass is also omega. That's not always true. Don't assume if you have one omega, it's all omegas in the problem. But in this case, it, do, it is true that when the cylinder makes one orbit, it, its orientation has also rotated through 2 pi. So in this case, LCM is going to equal, well, in magnitude, now this is just the LZZ about the center of mass, so I can use the one half um, M 
r naught squared, right? That's the IZZ about the center of mass times omega. And then for the direction, you have to use your uh, right-hand rule. Well, so first of all, x and y, z is out of the page here. It's got to be for a right-handed coordinate system. Remember, in a right-handed coordinate system, x hat cross y hat is equal to z hat. So work that out with your right-hand rule. You figure out that's out of the page. And now this omega going around like that, um, well, what, what's the direction of the angular momentum? So once again, uh, you use your right-hand rule, and it's uh, the omega is going around like this, right? That's the direction it's going. So that's into the page. So LCM is minus z hat. And if I add, let's go, ooh, let's go. If I add this term and this term together, I have a two halves m r squared omega. That's the first one, right? Because I've written one as two as plus one half. I get um, three halves m r squared omega, and then the direction is z hat. And what we worked out before was, um, and let me make myself some more space here to work. What we worked out before was the IZZ of the cylinder around the edge point was 3 halves m, this r not up here was squared, m r not squared. So look at that. The magnitude of this momentum I have is just IZZ times omega. So I could, and now this is the thing that Taylor says, this point right here was at rest right, in the case where the thing is rotating around that point. I could calculate my products of inertia around the point that is at rest and then do um, IZZ times omega is going to be the Z component of angular momentum. Or I could do this full expression here where I do RCM cross PCM plus LCM. Notice I get exactly the same answer in these two cases here. Now, there was a reading question where I said, um, I think the way I said it, is it true that the rotational kinetic energy or the rota or the angular momentum, I forget which one I asked, one of the two, um, of an object uh, whose a point on its edge is at rest, if you measure the angular momentum around that point, you will get the same thing as if you measure the angular momentum of the center of mass. And the answer is no, you don't. And this, right, you don't. What's the same is this expression, right? So L is not the same as LCM. L is the same as the whole thing over here. I've drawn too much on this board now. Um, so the point of all this is that using this expression for L, I get the same thing as if I take a point that is really at rest and I measure my moments or products of inertia around that point. It is often more convenient to use the motion of the center of mass and then add the rotation around that point. And we also have, and I'm not going to try and derive this, I'm going to get rid of a bunch of stuff here. So we've got this uh, moment of inertia thing. It also turns out that um, for a rigid body, uh, it's important that it's a rigid body because if there's like springs and things and the things can deform, there will be kinetic energy and um, in the relative motion of the various things uh, that the kinetic energy, and we use T in not time, but kinetic energy, remember the Lagrangian chapter, is going to equal one half times the mass times the speed of the center of mass squared plus T uh, rotational about CM, right? Which I'm, which we might write as one half I omega squared, but that only works in the special case where all your products of inertia are zero except for IZZ and omega is around Z. This, so this expression only works. Sometimes it works in physics 151, but we're going to go ahead and rotate in all kinds of ways now. So um, all right, this expression here is also very similar to this expression at the bottom, but notice they do not immediately follow from each other. Neither is obvious, nor do they immediately follow from each other. And just as an example, suppose you have two objects. So first of all, the magnitude of the momentum of an object is just mv. And the magnitude of the kinetic energy of a point mass moving is just one half mv squared. Right? These are two point. This is uh, a point mass of mass m moving at speed v in some direction. Well, suppose I have two objects, and I tell you that p1 is equal to twice p2. How do the kinetic energies of the two objects compare? And the answer is you don't know. 
Because it could be that they're both moving at the same speed, but m1 is twice m2. And then in that case, well, if, if the mass doubles, the kinetic energy will double. But it could be that they're two objects of the same mass, and v1 is twice v2, and then t1 will be four times t2. So kinetic energy and momentum both depend on mass and velocity, but because they depend on them differently, you can't immediately go from one to the other. You have to know how it breaks down. So by the same token, these two things do not immediately follow from each other. They look very similar. They're both equivalently useful, but they do not immediately follow from each other. Um, and this top one, though, is how you would handle something like, I don't know why I thought of this, but suppose I had a cylinder that's rolling, and then independently there's another cylinder rolling on the inside. How would I figure out the kinetic energy of the cylinder on the inside? Well, I could figure out the motion of its center of mass, by figuring out how it's rolling relative to the out thing and then add that to the outside. And then somehow, and this is the really tricky thing that I talked to a bunch of you about, what is the rotation rate of the thing on the inside? Put those together, I can use this for the kinetic energy. All right, so let's go back to the products of inertia in this case. So uh, what we had, the one that we've been working on all this time is just IZZ. Um, and that one is equal to, and I'm going to do the continuous form again. You can look in the book for the discrete form, the integral, and that's really a volume integral. I should have made it a triple integral, but we'll just accept that. Uh, rho dvol, right? By dvol, that's the dx, dy, dz. But now there were these other products of inertia, like for example, well, there were just two more, ixz and iyz, but we'll go with ixz. And that was defined as the integral of minus xz rho d volume. That's actually not how he defined it. He defined it as a sum. But if you go from the sum to the integral, this is what you'd get, right? It's, you should be able to figure that out. And if you can't, please talk to me about it, right? Well, of course, rho, as everything in this lecture, rho is the density. Um, and I'll just write it down. We also have iyz is equal to the integral of minus yz times the mass of the particle, which is rho d vol, right? Uh, okay, and so for example, let's go back to this cylinder that's rotating around its own center of mass, and we will measure these. We'll do these integrals about the center of mass here. I did izz before, so let's do i do ixz now. So ixz is equal to, and since rho, this is a solid cylinder, I'm going to factor rho out because it's a constant in this case. And then the limits of the integral will be the size of this thing. So r from 0 to r naught. r naught is the radius of it. z from uh, minus z0 over 2 to z0 over 2, where uh, z0 is the height of this thing. Um, so we have minus xz. So xz, well, z is easy. And then x is r cosine phi, right? That's what it is in cylindrical coordinates. And then d vol is r dr d phi dz. Well, in this case, um, let's just notice I could separate out the phi integral. The integral from 0 to 2 pi of cosine phi is 0. I could also have done the z integral by itself, right? Because the integral from minus z0 over 2 to z0 over 2 of z dz is also equal to 0. Isn't that nice? So um, ixz in this case is zero, and that's why um, in things like this, in physics 151, when you were uh, doing moments of inertia and stuff, you never talked about this product of inertia because um, uh, you were very careful, whether you realized it or not, to only set up stuff where you had enough symmetry that these things weren't zero, all right? Well, okay. Um, let's talk about a point mass, and I want to do this for two reasons. I want to introduce a new concept to you. So I'm going to have a point mass at M there, and let's suppose it's like a little ball that's connected by an extremely lightweight rod to this point here. We're going to call this the z-axis, and we're going to say that it's rotating at omega around the z-axis, right? So this guy is making circles like that as it goes around the z-axis. Um, it's got mass M. So instantaneously right now, it's V is out of the page, right? That little dot with a circle around it is a V that's out of the page. Let's define our axes as X out of the page, Y and Z 
like that. Uh, okay, and you could, of course, work out the angular momentum of this guy. And I've already done this, but it's going to be L is equal to R cross P. So in this case, R is, um, let's say, it's moving at, it's at radius R0. It's hard to decide variables. So it's minus R0 X hat. Uh, I just lied to you. It's minus R0 Y hat, right, because it's in the Y direction, cross... V uh, X hat um, times M, because I forgot the M from the momentum, you're going to get M V R zero Z hat, right? That's the angular momentum you could get just doing it this old fashioned way. Well, let's go ahead and do I Z Z. Now, you could very easily do I Z Z using the discrete sums that Taylor has in the book. So I'm not going to do that because you could easily do it. I want to introduce a new concept. And this concept is the concept of the Dirac delta function. Now, those of you who have been in modern and quantum have heard of this before. The Dirac delta function, it's a little bizarro when you first think about it, but the real purpose of a Dirac delta function is to make integrals easy. So don't be afraid of Dirac delta functions. Embrace them. They make integrals easy. How is a Dirac delta function defined? Well, I'll start in one dimension. So if I have x and I want to plot delta of x minus x zero. So that's my Dirac delta function. If I plot it, it looks like an infinite spike at x equals x zero. Right, so that's oh, it's hard to define that function. It's discontinuous. It's got an infinity in it, right? So, okay, this is a perverse little function here, but it's an extremely useful little function. Here's the real definition of the Dirac delta function, is that if you integrate over some range, x one to x two, of delta of x minus x naught dx. That integral is equal to 1 if x naught is within your range, right? So that would be see x1 is less than x naught is less than x2. So if x naught is within your range, the integral is 1, otherwise it's 0. So what's a direct delta function is something with infinite height and zero width, and it shows its infinity such that infinity times 0 is 1 in this case. Um, all right. Well, okay. So that's so so that's the definition of a Dirac delta function. Then, in three dimensions, you could also have a Dirac delta function, and the definition there would be the triple integral of delta of r vector minus r vector zero. Right. So this it, it's really um, this is a, uh, another way you could have written this is delta of x minus x zero, y minus y zero, z minus z zero, right? I could have written that the same way as this thing here. Um, Devol, right? That's also going to equal one or zero, depending on whether the range of your integral includes the point R zero. Right? So that's how delta functions work. Why? Why do you care? Well, um, that's the delta function is a way you can describe densities of point masses and discontinuous things. Oh, look, a computational physics. Is it 2 to 3 p.m. today? Uh, go away, calendar. Thank you. Um, right? All right, well, so there's one other thing before we can do this. There's one other thing I need to tell you about delta functions that makes them very nice and very useful. And I'll just go ahead. Well, I'll do the 1D one first. Um, in 1D, the integral of f of x times delta x minus x naught dx is equal to f of x naught. This is when I say delta functions make integrals easy. That's what I mean. You don't have to do the integral. You just evaluate the function at the place where the delta function is, right? And so this thing up here that I did, f of x, was just 1, right? And so I got 1 um, if the thing was included. And I'm assuming I'm integrating over all space from minus infinity to infinity there. So what a delta function does is it plucks out the value of the function at this thing. So that means now here I could, for this particle here, I could write that rho as a function of x, y, and z is equal to the mass of the particle times delta of 0, comma, y minus y plus r0, comma, 0, right? So the delta function is zero everywhere except at the place where the mass is, which is when y is minus r zero, right? That's, that's where I've drawn it right here. 
So that is a way you could write the density of a point mass. Now you're just sitting here thinking, and there is some validity to what you're thinking. Why bother? Why are you even doing integrals? This is clearly a discrete situation. Just do the discrete thing. Well, I want you to know about these delta functions because they're so amazingly useful. Um, and it, it is allow you when you have something that is an integral expression, and this will show up in modern physics, and you've seen it, some of you, uh, an integral expression that, and you need to put in something that has a point, delta functions are how you do it. Okay, so good. So now I know what my um, density as a function of x, y, and z is now that I have that. Now that I have that, I could work out my IZZ. Now I should point out this is going to be an instantaneous IZZ uh, because at different times the, the density is going to change. And so I'm calculating it just right now since I'm doing it for the density right now. So IZZ, and it's going to be the same old thing. So we've got our integrals, and I'm going to just integrate over all space now, right? So we integrate R from 0 to infinity, um, Z from minus infinity to infinity, and phi from 0 to 2 pi of x squared plus y squared um, times the density, which is m delta 0 comma y plus r0 comma 0 times the volume element, which is just dx dy dz. And again, delta functions make integrals easy. This is going to pluck out the value of the function at y equals minus r0. So this is going to give me um, y equals my 0 and x equals 0. So this is going to give me r0 squared times m, izz, right? That's what I get, which is what you would have gotten if you had started with the discrete thing anyway. So it's a little circular, uh, but there we are. So that's izz. Well, so let's do iyz using this delta function. And again, it's easy to do the discrete. Part of the reason I'm doing this is to just demonstrate, give practice with these delta function things is. So this is going to be the integral of minus, I'll pull that out front, minus yz times the density, so that's mass times zero, one, uh, the mass times delta, um, the particle is at x equals zero, the particle is at y equals minus r zero, so that's y minus the y of the particle, comma zero times the volume element, and now we're going to pull out um, the uh, the function, right, this is our f of x here, we're going to pull out the function when y equals r0 and z equals 0. Oh, look at that, i, y, z equals 0. Um, and that's very nice, and x, z would have been the same thing. Well, now let's make it more interesting. So let's go ahead here. Um, this is going to be the z axis. Here's the y axis. And then for this to work, x has to be sticking out of the page. That's, oops, sorry. Uh, issues. All right, stay put. Okay, that's the z-axis. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a particle right here, and I'm going to connect it to the origin by a very lightweight rod. It's hard to draw straight lines on this. All right, so that lightweight rod has very low mass. This is mass m. Okay, well, before we do these integrals and things, let's just start with, and then I'm going to say that this whole thing is rotating around the z-axis, right, which means this guy's making circles like that. So instantaneously its velocity once again is out of the page. So we have v is going to equal whatever its speed is. It's in the plus x direction and instantaneously its position is minus r0 assuming that's the radius of the circle that it's going around in um, in the y direction. Right? It's in the minus y direction. So um, but that's all but but it's also um, at some z0 plus z0 z hat, right? So the particle r has both a y and a z component now because um, it's offset at this angle. It's not just straight off. And so now if I do r, I'll factor the m out front, r cross v, I'm going to get, and we'll have, I'll keep the m factored out front. We have a minus r naught v, uh, r cross v, so that's y hat cross x hat um, plus z naught v z hat cross x hat. That's going to equal um, plus m r naught v z hat, because y hat cross x hat is minus z hat. 
and then z hat cross y hat is minus x hat, so this will be minus m z naught v x hat. And if I drew um, the direction of that, the direction of that is going to be something like that. And in fact, I could have done this uh, with the cross product. Um, so I do. I'm going to have to do an r cross v. So r is uh, up and to the left, like that. Um, R and then V is out, cross V, and I would have gotten the angular momentum off in that direction. Notice L and omega are in different directions here. All right, that's pretty important. This tells me that in general, L equals I omega is wrong. It only works if all your products of inertia other than I, Z, Z are zero. And, and we'll choose Z as the axis of omega. That's the only place this works. In general, that does not work. So again, in physics 151, we were always careful to choose cases where that did work. So let's work out our I, Z, Z and our I, Y, Z and our I, X, Z in this case here. All right, well, so first of all, let's write down our density. Again, left is an exercise for the alert reader do the discrete formula that's in the book, all right? You should get the same answer as I get here, assuming I do it right, which is not always obvious. Um, uh, all right, so do that as an exercise for the alert reader. I'm going to do the continuous thing again, more examples of these delta functions. So if I wanted to write this density, it's going to be m times a three-dimensional delta function of x at 0, then y is at minus r naught, and then z is at plus z naught. So that is the density. Um, so IZZ, you already know what the answer is going to be. IZZ is going to be the triple integral over all of space of x squared plus y squared times the density. Um, so that's this, 0 comma y plus r0 comma z minus z0 times the volume element dx dy dz. Delta functions make integrals easy. What you do, what this delta function is, it plucks out the value of this function at those positions. So that's going to be 0 squared plus minus r naught squared times m, right? So that's 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 the integral here. And I get m r naught squared. Oh, look, we already knew that. m r naught squared. That is i z z. Okay, that's i z z. Now let's do i y z. i y z. Um, is equal to the integral over all of space of minus yz times our density, right? So density times volume is the mass of the thing. So the density of m, 0 comma y plus r0 comma z minus z0 dx dy dz. Okay, and again, the delta function is going to pluck out this, the value of the function here. So we have minus, and then the value of y at the place of the delta function is minus r0. And the value of z is z0. If the m is still there, I'm going to get m r0 z0. This is a case where i y z is not equal to 0. All right. And that tells us that we're going to have a y component of the angular momentum, as you can see on the drawing above. All right. Um, so. In this case, um, Ly is going to equal Iyz omega. That works because omega is entirely along the z direction, right? And we had Lz was equal to Izz times omega. If you do Ixz, you'll discover that one is zero instantaneously here for this thing. All right. So products of inertia. So several things here. Um, all the products of inertia from the book, the, the most important single thing to take away from this, there's a whole bunch of important things to take away. The single most important thing is angular momentum and angular velocity do not have to point in the same direction. <laughs> and uh, the products of inertia are, well, if you assume that your angular velocity is entirely in the z direction, then these three products of inertia are the things you can use to figure out the three components of the angular momentum. In Taylor, he gave you all the expressions to do it for a collection of discrete points. 
What I've tried to do here is go from collections of discrete points to a continuous distribution. But then I also tried to go back from continuous distribution to discrete points by introducing these direct delta functions. All right, that's it for now.